welcome to today's episode of the Declutter Hub podcast. Your channel for super easy, no nonsense advice on how to declutter and organize your home. Please welcome your hosts, professional organizers, Ingrid Jansen and Leslie Spellman. Hello and welcome listeners to episode 41 of the Declutter Hub podcast. I'm Ingrid. And I'm Leslie. If you have clutter and want to sort it out, this is the show for you. In today's episode, Leslie and I are going to chat about what brought us to becoming a professional organizer. And the spotlight is on Leslie this week. So we've been doing these podcasts for a while now, and people are always curious how we ended up being a professional organizer and where our love for decluttering and organizing comes from. So I'll be the one asking Leslie lots of questions today so we can find out more about her story. So Leslie, spill the beans. Were you a really organized child? (laughs) Do you know what? I think the first thing to say is I've not got a great memory, if I'm truly honest. And so a lot of my friends, and I know people who are listening who I grew up with, remember loads and loads of things, and I really don't. But there's a couple of things that I remember. So first things first, I was an only child. And so I was brought up as an only child. And that makes a difference because what you don't have then is you don't have chats with your siblings about the way that you were brought up. So that kind of disappears. And so I'm just trying to make excuses for my distinct lack of memory. But the couple of things that I do remember about my childhood, and I kind of grew up in the 70s and 80s, that were relevant about decluttering and organizing, I think, are the first First of all, I used to absolutely love changing my room round all the time. So my bedroom, I probably changed it every four or six weeks, you know, move the bed, move the things in my ward, you know, change the drawers around, all that kind of stuff. So I was always very, very focused on maybe, you know, now I would call it aesthetics, I suppose, and using the space well and things like that. But it's something that really used to make me tick, whereas a lot of other people just lived in messy bedrooms. But I was always focused on having a neat bedroom. Um, some of that might be because I was an only child and I was trying to fill my days. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's that's the first thing really that I remember from sort of early childhood. That would be when I was kind of eight, nine, ten years old or something like that. Mm-hmm. And then the other thing that I remember was um, I used to get paid by my mum to clean out the kitchen cupboards. Did you ever did you ever get that? You know, where they're like, yeah. right, you can have 50p and you've got to clean you've got to clean out the whole of the kitchen and take all the things out and do all the food. I can I can remember you know, and we used to have these Tupperware was rife, wasn't it? Still is really, but rife in the 70s and those like orange Tupperware jars with the stickers on them. And I used to absolutely love putting the stickers on the spices and all that kind of stuff and rearranging the kitchen cupboards. So I guess that from an early age, I did have those kind of organizing genes because I used to, and it wasn't just the 50p for the, I think it was 50p. That seems quite generous maybe in the 70s, I don't know. But in my head, it was 50p or a pound for cleaning kitchen cupboards. And I used to like doing it. So maybe maybe it was there. The seed was sown at a very young age. And did it continue in your teens? Because sometimes teens can become a bit messy, can't they? So did it continue then? Do you know, I can't. I can't sit and say that I was always, you know, and still I'm not, I'm still, I'm not a meticulous person at all, which probably a lot of people would be surprised about as an organizer. It's all about having things in the right place for me and not being perfect. Um, the thing that I remember most about my teens, you know, I think I just floated through my teens in the way that everybody else does. I'm sure my mom and dad thought I was an absolute nightmare, um, but I was, <laughs> it was fine. But the one thing that I did, I was a really, really hard worker and I had multiple jobs. And so I always had a paper round. I worked in factories. I worked in British home stores at the food. So, you know, so I had loads and loads of Saturday jobs. And the one thing, the, the other couple of things that I did which again is, is related, I think, to decluttering and organizing, is I used to work for a company called Betterware. Are you familiar with that, with no. Betterware? No. I think now the equivalent would be, and this is probably British, and I'm, I'm sure there must probably be um, American equivalents as well, but it's like, I think it's like Clean Easy or Clean Ease. I don't even know how you say that now, but it's those catalogs that get sent out door to door um, it's probably changed now in format a little bit. It's probably mail order now, isn't it? But people used to come door to door to sell you things, give you the catalog. It's a bit like Avon used to be. Give you the catalog. <laughs> used to choose cleaning products and things for your house, order them. And I used to deliver them then on a Friday night. And I was always astonished about the amount of 
um, I'm trying to find a, a, a nice word for this, but the amount of stuff that people used to have, household stuff that they would buy to clean their blinds or to clean their work surfaces or hob cleaners or dusters or whatever. All the time, I used to have regular customers continually buying, cleaning and organizing products from Betterware. I I was really happy because I made loads and loads of money out of it. But I was fascinated about the continual spending on household and organizing items. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know better where, but I, I can understand, I know exactly where you're coming from. I think I understand the whole principle about it. Yeah, just going door to door and trying to sell people things. And it's quite an interesting concept that doesn't really happen these days, any, uh, does it anymore? But, you know, so a, I, I was, very, you know, I had a good work ethic. I was very strong. I liked making money. Maybe I shouldn't have become a professional organizer, actually, because that's, <laughs> yeah, that's the downside. But anyway, um, so, um, but yeah, so. I think I did that in my teenage years and that had an impact in the way that I thought a little bit as well. So then you moved on from your teenage years into your early career. So what did you end up doing? And, and did you, did your job help you with your organizing skills or did you, did you use your organizing skills into your early career? I think there's what there's just before I jumped to early career, I think there's something that I wanted to talk about, which was when I went to uni. Um, so after, obviously as a teenager, then I, I went to university and um, some people may not know this, but I studied Dutch at university, <laughs> um, which has got no bearing on the fact that I'm uh, friends with Ingrid now. But I, so I studied German and Dutch uh, when I went and I spent my year abroad. As you do you, uh, when you're at uni, you go for your third year, um, you spend abroad. And I went to Holland. I chose to go to Holland instead of Germany for my um, year abroad. And I think in terms of growth as an individual, I think going to a foreign country for me is one of the biggest things in terms of growth and in terms of impact. Because all of a sudden you see the way that people do things differently. So, you know, different countries have different traits and general things that happen. You, you know, so it's gross generalization. Everyone is different. But there are traits, I think, that are common to a nationality, aren't they? Um, and so it's interesting to come out of the British culture, go across to the Dutch culture as a 20-year-old, which I was at the time, and just work things out for myself, you know, live on my own completely independently for the first time in my life, take my stuff over on my, in my Talbot Sunbeam on the ferry um, across to, to Holland uh, and, and kind of work work out how to do things differently I was there there was no internet there was no let me find somewhere to live I literally had to go on boards and find somewhere to live and so you know, became very independent very quickly and had to think on my feet I had to look at houses and flats that were going to be suitable and I was really lucky because I had a fabulous um, friend over there who completely embraced me and did not speak a word of English to me from the minute I landed which was fantastic for my Dutch my Dutch now for the record is rubbish but I can listen to every single word that Ingrid says to her husband and kids I know exactly what she's saying I can't speak back to her but I can understand everything she's saying so there's no secrets so one of these days I keep saying we'll have a conversation in Dutch but I'm sure it would not flow after what is that like 30 years of non-use of Dutch I think I would be a bit rubbish compared to um, Ingrid's meticulous English but yeah, so I think going to Holland, just to, oh, and the other thing which is interesting, isn't it, that we found out recently, is that Jan, who's Ingrid's husband, who's also Dutch, lived in the same town as me the same year, didn't he, in Arnhem? I How know. Weird is that? That's so weird, isn't it? You know what? You say it has no bearing that you went to Holland, but I think that the, it was meant to be that you and I were going to do the Declutter podcast and we, we find out all this stuff and you actually studied in Holland and you can eavesdrop on me and Jan chatting or when I'm telling <laughs> off the kids and I'm thinking nobody understands, but you know what I'm saying to them. I know, I do, I do. So, so um, was there anything about the, the Dutch culture that you thought was interesting um, about Dutch people? Did you find out anything? Um, I think with, uh, whether it's got a bearing on decluttering and organising, I'm not sure, but uh, in, in, in my relationship with you, it has, <laughs> for sure. Um, I think Dutch people are very direct. They call a spade a spade, um, as people may have worked out from the podcast, Ingrid. And so, and so I, you know, you and I are both like that anyway. I have that trait as well. And so I think, yeah, there's a, there's a directness with the Dutch people, which can be quite refreshing. Um, it's also something that you need to get used to at times as well, <laughs> but it can be one way or the other. And I think one of the things that I do feel about the 
at the Dutch. And this is this was 1988 or something like that. I felt that there was more a more frugal nature to the Dutch. So I think they were, took care of finances perhaps a little bit better and were more focused on that than we were in the UK. Again, that's a gross generalization, but I think there was definitely an eye on the pennies. Would you agree with that? Yeah. 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 And so I think that that, that has a bearing as well. And so of course, there was a million things that I picked up and that I learned when I was in Holland, loads of things. But I think for me, in terms of forming you as an individual and as a person and making you see things differently and have a different perspective, I think going to a foreign country definitely um, was critical for me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you came back being completely fluent in, in, in Dutch. I was. I actually was at that time. I was completely fluent. And look at me now. I can barely string a sentence together. It's so <laughs> sad. But anyway. All right. So then, so where, where did you end up working then? When you finished uni, what, what came on your path? So I went to work for Sainsbury's, which is a big um, UK retailer, food retailer, um, went into retail management. And so again, it's very pragmatic, very practical. You know, you do have to do your stint uh, on a checkout. You do have to do your stint stacking shelves. Yeah, you have to spend your time on customer service working with people. Very soon into my career with Sainsbury's, I moved into customer service. And so that was obviously where my skills were. So definitely the people side of things. Because being a professional organizer is 90% about the people, isn't it, Ingrid? So, you know, certainly people skills has been a big part of my career. Um, and I started that off with Sainsbury's. Went into retail, worked in the branches for a year. And then I had an area role where I started doing training and sort of mentoring of people and project management. And so I sort of managed projects manage people taught people how to do things this was at a time when the internet was just coming in this is so how old I am um, so it was training people how to use the world wide web and training people how to use word perfect and things like that so it's quite interesting but it was all about trying to break things down and simplify it for people and so I absolutely you know one of the most formative things for me was that um, I worked for Sainsbury's probably for about four or five years and I think that was the most critical part because you know I was really lucky to work for such an established company that invested heavily in training and I think that's that's why I feel so strongly that training is so important now there was no training for us as professional organizers when we started but we now train for other people and I think that training is something that everybody needs to invest in and I got that message certainly from Sainsbury's when I was working there Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so I did so yeah, I worked for Sainsbury's. Uh, and then one of the things that I did as well at Sainsbury's was I was, um, I had a baby. <laughs> yeah, so not just at Sainsbury's, but so I had Luke, um, my youngest, when I was still working at Sainsbury's. And it was quite interesting at that time because Sainsbury's you're old, was... You're old, your oldest. My oldest, yes. This is a long time ago. So I'm like 20, how old am I at this point? 27 uh, when I had Luke. So I'd worked for Sainsbury's then for five years at that point. And it was kind of like, right, okay, then, well, when you want to continue your career, you can come back. There was no sense of job sharing or flexibility or, you know, that that kind of thing that it, part time wasn't really going to work because the job that I had, I was traveling up and down to Scotland, three, four hour trips and things like that. So it, did, it wasn't really conducive to having a baby uh, as well. And so I very much wanted to do a kind of flexible working job share. They couldn't. Um, accommodate that at the time so I went to work as a PA to a district manager to so to one of Sainsbury's senior managers and he wanted me to set up all his back-end office systems so now of course there's all apps that can do absolutely everything then we were trying to do everything from first principles on word or whatever and trying to create documents and stuff like that so that's the kind of thing that I did so and that that I think is where my love of paperwork and statistics and things like that comes from as well so so that's what I did for Sainsbury's and I did that for another year and then I left oh yeah so it was good yeah but also again those those organizing skills were helpful for you in in that job as a PA setting up systems and and creating order and being able to retrieve items so all the techniques we're using now you've you've done yourself yeah exactly and so I think it so you don't really know at the time it's interesting isn't it where people you know, just to jump back to you and I uh, train other professional organizers. And within that training, you know, people always get nervous because they're sort of saying, 
well, I've, I don't really know what to do. I've not really got any background in professional organizing. And we say all the time, don't we? It's nothing to do with whether you've been trained in something. Obviously, the training course that we run is really important for them. But it's about where, you know, have you been in social services? Have you, have you worked in probation? Have you moved the house 10 times? Have you downsized? Have you? So all of those standard practical household skills are the things that make people into good professional organizers and the things that you pick up along the way are absolutely critical so I can definitely see a path now as I look at it that led me here as many other people can in their careers uh, but it's but you don't really know it as you're going through that path through that yeah. journey do you yeah and you, you know your journey we're going to talk about in another podcast is equally as interesting but very different you know yeah. and brings out to a different place so um Yes. So that was when I was working. Then I, um, I stopped working because we moved to America in 2001 um, for my husband's job. I did not have a spouse visa. So sadly, she says, not sadly at all. I couldn't work while I was there. So I just had a really nice holiday uh, with my kids while my husband was working. So we moved to New Jersey. Um, which I absolutely loved, again, for the same reasons as moving to Holland. All of a sudden, I'm in my 30s by this point, and I see the way that things can be done in a different way. You know, obviously, the American culture is similar to ours in so many ways, but also different. And so it took me out of my comfort zone. And, you know, I was dropped in America with no friends. You know, I was lucky that I was, you know, I got great friends really, really quickly um, that really involved me in everything. So I was very, very lucky. But I think it really does make you kind of resilient and, you know, and you see things in a different way. Um, what did I learn when I was in America that led me into professional organizing? Well, the first thing that I learned when I was in America was that there was such a thing as a professional organizer. <laughs> so that was quite formative. Um, <laughs> Because I'd never even, in the same way that lots of people have not heard of it now, you know, when I was, this is going back 10, 15 years now, um, I'd never knew that such a thing existed. Somebody to come in and sort out your house and help you to declutter and understand the emotions. I just didn't know that, that kind of thing existed. But in America, it's, it's more established than it is here. There's about four or 5,000 professional organizers working in the US. And so it's a little bit further advanced, isn't it, than we are in this country, Ingrid. Mm -hmm. so, um, so that's the first time that I came across a professional organizer. Um, and I think that was very formative. I also think the other thing that I learned when I was there, which is very different now, was the disposable nature of the way that they viewed stuff. So I think there was, def there was definitely a faster turnaround. So they would use plastic cutlery and plastic plates. There would be a curbside recycling scheme where you could recycle old barbecues and things like that. And I was always astonished by how much stuff would go out on this curbside recycling every week. Because I think in Britain, we still had this kind of make do amend mentality where we would keep things in our garages. Whereas in America, I think there was much more kind of we've used that, let it go. We've used that, let it go. So it's quite interesting, really. But those are the two things. I learned a million other things in America while I was there. Of course I did. Um, but those are the two things that stick with me in terms of the professional organizing side of things. But also, I mean, doing an international move with a husband and kids is like a whole different ball game, isn't it? Moving internationally. I mean, moving house within your own country is already can be a big deal, but internationally it's a whole different ball game. And I think we, you learn probably a lot from that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Because you've got to really think about what you want to take. And this is not, you know, when I moved to Holland, I, whatever I could fit in my tell that some beam I could take across the water to Holland and it actually wasn't that far away but you know I had to move my whole house and family you know two kids put send them to school into a rented house and things like that and really take with us what we wanted and the interesting thing was even though I was quite good in the decluttering side of things when we came back there was a whole load of things that we had left in our loft that we absolutely didn't need when we came, you know, so you just don't know. That's it. it forces those kind of habits on you and you really have to review your stuff as well. And you're absolutely right. International move is, does involve a lot of planning and organization and thought. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, uh, pff, we're going to talk in my journey. I mean, I've moved several times internationally, so I know, I know <laughs> everything about it. It's, um, it's, it's, it's very, you learn a lot from it. You do. And, it, you know, and I want to say it's a real privilege to be able to live in, in other cultures. 
is yeah. a real privilege and something yeah. that we don't take lightly uh, yeah. and to learn from that is fantastic and to just yeah. pick lots of different things up so yeah, yeah. no yeah. really formative my, my, my year in Holland and my two and a half years in America were really really critical it yeah. felt the two and a half years in America felt as if it could have been 10 years really do you know what I mean mm. so yeah. yeah lovely at one point you came back to to good old blighty and then yeah. what happened And then um, I got a book. Um, my husband nearly divorced me over this, I have to say. I got, <laughs> I decided that I wanted a bigger house. Um, and my husband was not very happy about that, uh, actually. So it wasn't great. But I got my way and we bought um, what people would call a doer upper, I guess, but what other people would call a completely derelict house. So it was, there was no roof on it. Um, There was no electricity. So it's a kind of a four bedroom. It was a five bedroom, um, four floor, semi detached Victorian property. You know, really beautiful features, you know, nice stained glass windows, big front door, but completely wrecked because it had been lived in by a compulsive hoarder. Um, and when I say that, I mean a proper hoarder um, where none of the rooms were fit for purpose. You could not get into the house in the front door or the back door. So there was a platform built around the outside, a scaffold platform built around the outside of the house. And there was um, in the back wall of the house, uh, the brickwork had been smashed through and that was the entryway to the house. Oh. Um, to get upstairs, I've got quite a nice sort of wide staircase. You couldn't get up the stairs. And so there was a ladder put up through the stairwell um, to get upstairs. Um, it was really really you know everything was there was water coming everywhere there was no electricity <laughs> it was there was down water pouring through the roof everything like that so it was quite the project um so where did you live at this time <laughs> <laughs> so we still for a little while so we bought the house we still lived in our old house for a little while and then we needed to you know this is right at the time of the financial crash as well in 2008 which is another reason why my husband's like why are we doing this? why are we doing this when all of the house prices are plummeting <laughs> anyway so yeah it was, a, it was a tricky tricky time um but we're here still here to tell the tales so that's fine um so but I just had this urge to do something really special and I think most of that was that I could craft this house to be exactly what I wanted it to be obviously I had a great blank canvas a nice big property with great room sizes and things like that um but we knocked it around the most exciting thing for me was putting storage solutions in so I've got some great I mean you've been to my house Ingrid I've got some fantastic little nooks and crannies where I've got some great storage whether that's DVD storage or a laundry room you know that I kind of All of a sudden, I was like, oh, look at that space there. I could put a laundry room there. And so I was able to do that because I had a team of like 10 builders here for six months doing it. So it was really, you know, so project management wise, I project managed the whole thing, um, was involved in everything, which I absolutely loved. Um, and I really created, I knew what I wanted because I'd, I'd got my three kids now, my family, and I knew what a family of five, how we could exist in this house and, you know, make it perfect really in terms of storage and I still believe that it is you know what I mean I'm, I'm very very lucky and very privileged to have a house that I do um so yeah so that was really critical in terms of so that the practical side of it was was important because I could craft this house and I could really look at things and look at storage but one of the critical things was because the house had been lived in by a compulsive hoarder You know, we're talking that there was 12, 15 cars on the drive. It took three months for the land to be cleared outside because it was so overgrown. And so people, it was quite the transformation. And so people would walk past the house when we were in and stop and talk and stare and look and go, oh my God, that looks amazing compared to what it used to look like. Um, and talk to us about the guy that had lived here. And I was always very, I always found it very strange because it was always very very critical of his hoarding disorder which was clearly a, a huge mental health issue that people were saying it's ridiculous and, and many people not everybody but many people had zero sympathy for this guy and did not recognize it as a mental health condition whereas I had that sympathy right from the get-go if that makes sense and so I think that was important even though when I moved in here the hoarding was gone the house was cleared um I think people's opinions of this guy that had lived there really resonated with me and made me think. And it's a year later that I settled my business. Mm. Yeah. 
it made you probably think about, I don't know, maybe how people need help. Yeah, I just think, you know, for something, you know, I didn't meet I didn't meet him. He'd already died before we moved in here. But I think just to hear people talking about something that was close to me, because this was now my house, and people talking about a transformation and being, you know, overawed by the transformation that had gone on with the house and really wanting to see it and being completely fascinated by this condition, which means that people, people keep more stuff than they need to. Mm -hmm. There was a fascination there that definitely started to, you know, at that point, I wasn't like, I want to be a professional organizer. I wasn't at all. But I think later, I realized that that did have an impact on me because, you know, it's important to, to know that you can, I know it's a different thing and that was his house and this is now my house and I'm not transforming his house with him in it. But, you know, it is possible to make a transformation in a house on a practical level once somebody understands and understands. And not everybody's got hoarding disorder, mm. but people do have psychological, emotional barriers with clutter. And I think that talking to people at my gate um, outside my house really made me think about that. Okay. Right. And then, so you finally decided to set up your business. So all your experience and all your things that happened in your life um, made you become a professional organizer almost. It was, was the, the path you were going on. <laughs> I think it was. I think it was always, you know, and it, it is interesting because there are, you know, professional organizers nowadays come in all different shapes and sizes. I mean, even you and I come, we, we are very, very aligned in our thinking, uh, but we come to it from a different place sometimes as well in terms of the way that we think and the way that we get, we get to the same place, I think, but we come at it from different angles. And I think it's all, for me, it's all about the practical project management skills, the simplification of things and the people side of things and, and making people think about the way that they're doing things and then simplifying things into a system that they can manage and not overcomplicating things. And so I think it's all about breaking things down. And I think throughout my sort of professional life then, I did a lot of that, you know, and, and with my house renovation, I was able to do that. I was very lucky, you know, to be able to go through working for great companies and traveling abroad. This is a very privileged life that I've held, had and I don't, you know, um, take that for granted at all. But I think it's led me to, to I know that I want to help people who struggle a little bit with clutter on a practical level. So I do do other things. I do project management. I do interior design, that kind of things. But what I love is I love decluttering because that's the thing that makes the biggest impact. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Leslie. So that's your story of how you became a professional organizer. Is there anything else you want to share with our listeners? I mean, I completely skipped over the fact that I've got three kids and that you do learn quite a lot. <laughs> so sorry, kids, I forgot to mention uh, in, throughout this whole podcast that I raised a family in the middle of that. Um, I think, you know what, I think when you've got a family and you've got to go through weekly routines or even if you've not got a family, you know, daily routines and weekly routines and cleaning routines and all that kind of stuff is really, really critical as well. So all of those things, all of these things have a little impact and had the, so these little seeds, don't they, um, throughout your journey. And I, I can't wait to um, do the podcast with you because I'm sure there's things in there that you didn't know about me. And equally, I'm going to find out things about you that I didn't know. I think, you know, it's interesting when you have to reflect on your own life and say, right, what, why am I here? You know, because I, I came into this when I was 40, you know, so I was, you know, quite advanced in years <laughs> not that advanced um but you know I didn't come into this in my 20s and now professional organizers are coming into the into the industry in their 20s whereas I think when you and I started it was something that people were doing in later years wasn't it yeah. so um no you know we're in a very privileged um, profession we absolutely love what we do and just being able to make a difference to people is really really lovely yeah um Listeners, we hope you are inspired by Leslie's journey and maybe think to yourself now, what have I done in my past that can help me in my own decluttering and organizing in my own house? Because you, you probably have done something that is really helpful to bring you on the path and think, you know what, maybe when I was in school, I did always organize my papers really well in my folder. So why is my paperwork now very messy? Well, I know I can do it because I've done it before. So by sharing our stories, we hope it inspires you um, to, um, to, to think about that and, and 
Leslie, is there anything else before we close this episode, what you'd like to uh, share with our listeners? Yeah, I just want to say, I think a lot of people, you know, when I've obviously spent the last half an hour talking about the kind of things that I'm good at, you know what I mean, in principle or have been good at, but there are so many things that I'm not good at. And when with my clients, I'm like, why can I not get this right with decluttering and organizing? Because you're really fantastic at these other things that you've learned in your life. And so it, it wouldn't do for us all to be the same, would it? You, yeah. know, you and I are completely fascinating with decluttering and organizing, and that absolutely makes us tick. And it's critical to our lives. Whereas it's not, well, it, it kind of is to other people, but they've got other skills that we've not got. And so yeah. don't do yourself an injustice, but you know, and do yourself down because you haven't got these decluttering and organizing skills. And remember that for most people, organizing skills can be learned. Yeah. Very, very true. There is, I can rattle off a whole list of stuff that I'm not very good at. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, I just have to be good at decluttering and organizing and I happen to love it as well you know so that's that's lucky I guess but there's loads of stuff I'm not very good at and I find other people to outsource stuff to <laughs> exactly because you need to work with your strengths and um, and it, exactly what you were saying earlier Leslie this is not about perfectionism us being organized it has nothing to do with having a perfect house and having the perfect thing on everything perfect all the time let's just start by being able to find your keys every day. You know, you know, that's that, that those are the things that are helpful. And so listeners, um, think about that. And I hope this, uh, you've enjoyed listening to this podcast and, um, we really appreciate for, for being here. And, and thank you so much for taking the time to listen today. And if you'd like to get more tips and advice, please follow us on social media. We are on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook as at The Club Hub. And we have a lovely, lively, supportive Facebook group community where we chat all things clutter. And you can search for The Declutter Hub community on Facebook. And we'd love to see you there. If you don't want to miss the next weekly episode, please subscribe to the Declutter Hub podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Stitcher, and it will pop into your notifications each Friday. See you next time. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of the Declutter Hub podcast. Check out declutterhub.com for more inspiration, and don't forget to tune in next week.